Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am Dr. Claudia Albers, Planet X research and professional physicist. And today I'd like to bring to you another one of my articles. This one is entitled Biological and Ecological Weapons in Use Against Us. Now, Scott Sion recently came across and shared with me a document available on the U.S. Department of Defense website from 1997. And this document is a transcript of a meeting between the then Secretary of Defense, William S. Cohen, and other people. One person named in the transcript, who appears to have been at the meeting, is Senator Nunn. Now, towards the bottom of the transcript, a few paragraphs appear which mention biological and echo weapons. As you can see, this is uh, the transcript. And these are the words that appear further down. There are some reports, for example, that some countries have been trying to construct something like an Ebola virus. And that would be a very dangerous phenomenon, to say the least. Alvin Tufler has written about this in terms of some scientists in their laboratories trying to devise certain types of pathogens that would be ethnic specific so that they could just eliminate certain ethnic groups and races. And others are designing some sort of engineering, some sort of insects that can destroy specific crops. Others are engaging even in an echo type of terrorism whereby they can alter the climate, set off earthquakes, volcanoes remotely through the use of electromagnetic waves. So there are plenty of ingenious minds out there that are at work finding ways in which they can wreak terror upon other nations. It's real and that's the reason why we have to intensify our efforts and that's why this is so important. So in other words, there are scientists working on these things. So we have to make sure that we are on top of this and we must get the answers first. We we must make sure we have these weapons at our disposal first. Or is it that these scientists are not necessarily in other countries and are working for the US or simply for the shadow government of the world? After all, which is the only country that has an unlimited black budget to develop new weapons? This was in 1997, 11 years ago. If they knew so much about the possibilities then, which may not even have been possibilities, but simply in the beginning stages of being deployed for use, what can they do now? This paragraph suggests that the capability for controlling the climate, creating an Ebola virus, destroying specific crops, creating earthquakes, and even setting off volcanic eruptions, at least uh, was within the realm of possibility in 1997, and that they were keen to develop it fully. These weapons may have been in the testing stage then. Would these weapons be in use now then? And these are very powerful weapons which can be used without anybody knowing that they are being used. If you can attack a nation such as, for example, Japan with an earthquake weapon, who can really know if it was an attack at all, since it could have been a naturally produced earthquake? So is it terror at all, or is it just um, a war behind the scenes? What about destroying a country's ability to feed its people by destroying its crops? Who is to know that it was a weapon and not a natural disaster? And we do know that terrorists do what they do in order to create terror, in order to make nations afraid of them. So if these weapons are used as terrorist attacks, who's going to fear them? Everyone will think it was a natural disaster. However, it seems that it is not so much countries that are under attack, at least not the leaders of those countries or the military of those countries, but the people, the civilians, the majority of the Earth's population is under attack. And it is under attack on several fronts. The Earth's population is under attack with the chemtrail spraying, severe artificial created weather, um, 
and fires that devastate whole regions and are started with plasma weapons. Although the weather weapons may be used beforehand in order to create drought in the region first so that the fires can be disguised as natural occurrences. Now in article 33 entitled artificial weather, I wrote that I reached the conclusion that the weather was being artificially controlled after studying the behavior of Hurricane Harvey, which devastated parts of Texas at the end of August 2017. The hurricane moved inland and then backed up, thus demonstrating that it was under intelligent control. I then found a website, and uh, it's called weatherwar101.com, where I obtained very clear information about how extensive the manipulation of our weather has become and for how long it has been going on. Now, the burning of fossil fuels, which is what you basically see here, it creates pollution. Uh, it leads to the creation of CCNs, which are cloud condensation nuclei, which are too small for the production of raindrops. CCNs are small particles around which water vapor condenses into droplets of water, thus creating clouds. Pollution created by fossil fuels produces droplets which are too small to ever fall as rain. And a report on this research done by Na Daniel Rosenfeld on this uh, appeared on a BBC News webpage on March 10th, 2000. And this report was entitled, Air Pollution Stops Rain. Thus, normal evaporation from the ocean and lakes is not enough to produce rain, not as long as there's this pollution in the air. So huge amounts of extra steam, which places a huge deal more of water vapor in the atmosphere, becomes necessary. And this is what these cooling towers on power stations do. They create the steam. So you can see the steam coming out of these cooling towers. Now the amount of steam coming from these cooling towers is controlled and programmed to create weather systems or clouds. This manipulation has been going on for some 100 years, but now they have not only learned how to produce weather systems, they have also learned how to produce hurricanes and tornadoes and steer them using lasers on satellites. Once clouds are produced, these can be turned into tight spiraling weather systems and therefore into hurricanes and tornadoes by creating the right conditions in the Earth's ionosphere i.e. with electrical currents in the ionosphere. Weather systems are electrical in nature and it is electrical currents in the ionosphere which cause water molecules to rise and thus create low pressure systems. High pressure systems can also be created with a current spiraling in the opposite direction. Currents in the ionosphere can be created by ionizing specific areas of the ionosphere using microwave radiation or lasers, and the weather systems that are created can then be steered by the laser satellites operating from orbit. So the whole system can be controlled from space satellites. And you may look at the video entitled Professor James McKenney on Weather Modification and uh, there's the link. It's also obvious that the weather has been weaponized and is now being used against the population of the US and other countries such as the UK, Japan and many East Asian countries which have been attacked by severe typhoons over and over again. At the moment September 6, 2018 there are four tropical storms affecting the world's weather. And you see these here, there are two in the Pacific, um, Norman and Olivia. Um, Norman is close to Hawaii, so it's that one. Gordon is over the US here, and Florence is in the Atlantic, so it's approaching the US right now. These severe storms are used to create flooding in various areas, which destroys lives, displaces, people out of their homes and creates economic hardship for the people of the region. And here we see thunderstorm activity along the equatorial regions 
and the, the purple color indicates a more severe a thunderstorm activity. So you can see it's along the equatorial regions of the Earth. Now, these storms are created by currents in the ionosphere, which can be artificially induced. But no thunderstorms would be possible without, I mean, not with rain. Um, you would just get uh, perhaps some thunder, but no rain. So um, real thunderstorms with rain, um, it can only be created if um, steam is added to the atmosphere. Now, so these uh, are steam producing platforms and these can be placed wherever the creation of clouds is desirable and may have been placed off the coast of Africa and along the Atlantic in order to facilitate the creation of hurricanes which can then be steered to several coastal cities in the US and even the UK or Ireland. There is evidence that earthquakes are electrical in nature. This evidence comes from strange lights which sometimes appear before and during large earthquakes. And uh, for more details, you may look at Article 38 entitled The Electrical Nature of Earthquakes. This means that earthquakes can be induced by currents in the ionosphere, which will then induce currents inside the Earth. This means that earthquakes can in be induced through artificial induction of currents in the ionosphere and directly into the ground. Then, since volcanic activity is associated to seismic activity, as long as you target areas where there are magma reservoirs close to the surface, it's not, it should not be too difficult to induce a volcanic eruption using the same electrical current induction process that will also provoke an earthquake or the production of a severe storm. Earthquakes can also be produced by a celestial object approaching Earth and exerting a gravitational force on it. However, the gravitational interaction arises between particles which are charged and is closely linked to the electrostatic interaction. So the two interactions always work together. You do not get one without the other. For more details on what I discovered on gravity, you may look at the book entitled Planet X Revealed gravity and light. Um, now volcanic lightning, as you can see here, is an indication that rock is capable of producing lightning underground and that the earth is electrical in nature. And that's what earthquakes are as well. They're basically lightning discharges within the earth. Now, the large-scale spraying of aerosols or chemtrails in the atmosphere seems to have started at the end of 1997 or beginning of 1998. And you may look at the article uh, entitled Chemtrails Project Cloverleaf, that's article 219, for more details. Now, Dr. Edward Teller outlined the plan to scatter millions of tons of electrically conductive metallic particulates in the stratosphere, apparently as a way to reduce global warming in 1997. But this was an outright lie, as these part particles, uh, particulates, which are particles in suspension, actually increased the greenhouse effect as detailed by a patent which I will write about, which I will show um, you um, a bit further down. Now, the U.S. Air Force document entitled Weather as a Force Multiplier, owning the weather in 2025, uh, the date is probably a misdirection. They are obviously doing it right now. Lists the many ways in which weather and climate modification can be used as weapons. Among the list is storm creation and modification, fog and cloud creation, precipitation, which is rain enhancement, precipitation denial, in other words, creating drought, and artificial creation of space weather. In other words, artificial uh, aurora 
they can make our magnetosphere seem as if it's been impacted by a CME or fast solar wind. The camp trail operation is carried out all over the world, but the United States seems to have been the place from where it was done first. It seems to have spread to other countries after that. I did not actually see any camp trails in South Africa until 2016. This indicates that the U.S. military is deeply involved in this operation and that they did just what was discussed in the transcript shown in Figure 1. They made sure that they had the capability before anyone else. However, since this is now being done all over the world, it means that all nations have agreed to it because if they hadn't, why would not the Air Force of different nations shoot down these military aircraft that are spraying in these nations' airspace? The fact that the shooting down of chemtrail spraying aircraft is unheard of means that all nations have joined together in order to fight and destroy and deceive their own populations. This becomes very clear when one realizes that manufactured viruses and desiccated blood cells are included in the chemtrail aerosols, in addition to heavy metals and radioactive compounds such as thorium, which are all highly toxic to living organisms. This therefore implies that chemtrails are being used as a bioweapon delivery system. And you may look at the book entitled Chem Trails, The Silent Killer for more details. Now, Chem Trails, besides facilitating the control of the climate and the delivery of bioweapons, also produce a greenhouse effect, which helps the atmosphere retain heat when not being illuminated by the sun. You may look at Article 223 entitled Chem Trails Increase Greenhouse Effect, indicating a weakening sun. And here we see a patent from 1991 describing a method of using metal oxide particles of very low ref reflectivity, in other words, they are dark, for converting black body radiation emitted by Earth to wavelengths that will be re-emitted into space. It also describes the mechanism by which high reflectivity or shiny particles increase the greenhouse effect. Chemtrail particulates have high reflectivity. They are metallic, so they are shiny, and so increase the greenhouse effect. So we can see they are lying and lying and lying to us. So in addition, chemtrails, because they contain huge amounts of metallic particles, increase the conductivity of the atmosphere which then facilitates the use of plasma or laser weapons. These weapons seem to also not have been designed to protect the civilian population of any country, but rather to attack them, as these seem to be used to start fires. And you may look at Article 106 entitled California Population Attacked with Fires for more details. And here we see a laser weapon in operation. Obviously, this narrow beam of light can only be produced by a laser. And as you can see, it's starting a fire. Or it, um, it targeted some material that then ignited. And these weapons can be used to target certain materials and thus explain why, and can explain why steel may burn whilst wood does not. And they may be... Uh, side by side. The reason is that the light beam can be produced at different frequencies, which are resonant frequencies for different materials. When a material is targeted by light at the correct resonant frequency for that material, the light superheats the atoms and molecules in that material. In other words, the atoms and molecules start vibrating faster and faster to the point that the material ignites. Thus, as more energy is driven into it by the beam continuing to de deliver energy into it, the material reaches such high temperatures that it vaporizes or explodes and then burns from the inside outwards as the inside reaches higher temperatures than the outside. This is a case of light energy being transformed into heat or kinetic energy of the particles making up the material. And these are the directed energy weapons that produce uh, lasers, 
um, high, high energy lasers at various frequencies. Here they are mounted on aircraft. They are also mounted on satellites. So in conclusion, there is a war going on. This war is not between nations. This is a war on the civilian population of this world. The leaders of this world have decided to mark us for extermination and they have aimed their weapons at us. The question we should therefore ask ourselves is, since it seems that the planet X system is set to destroy the surface of this planet and make life here on Earth impossible, See Article 244 entitled The Planet X System, Destroy of Star Systems. Why would they want to kill off most of the world's population now? If we are all going to die anyway, why do they want to bring that end about a little sooner? And these are the references. This is Dr. Claudia Albers, Planet X physicist. Thank you for watching.